Mr. President, you've been the president of COP21. We have a head of a delegation of an upcoming COP, so a lot of expertise here uh, uh, amassed on this uh, stage. Clearly, COP serves a very important function. But there are a lot of people who also say, look, these are important gatherings, but at the end of the day, a lot of pledges are being made, pledges for actions. And then people leave, and there's no accountability, and there's no transparency afterwards. How can we track the steps and developments better in the aftermath of what is undoubtedly an important event? But where's the longevity here? Well, it's a big question. Uh, there are critics about carbs, and uh, we can share these critics because they are heavy and so on and so forth. But what else? What else? Do you know another opportunity to get together all the governments, uh, the companies, the NGOs, and to compel uh, the different states to take uh, commitments and to check if the commitments are fulfilled or not? We don't have right now a better system. And therefore, uh, the question uh, is still there. Uh, how to be sure that the commitments will be fulfilled? It's a more general question. It doesn't apply only to climate. And the problem is that today, it's rather a philosophical uh, observation, uh, the main problems of humanity are international, interdisciplinary, and intergenerational. And we don't have a system of governments which is able to tackle these new elements, okay. But uh, I think what is necessary, first, during the COP, and it is the importance of the presidency, to gain the trust of the 200 states which will be there. Uh, you know, there's always a sort of fear by the different member states saying, well, probably the president of the COP has the solution in its pocket and, okay, no, you have to build trust. And if you build trust, you can do very important things. I remember, for instance, that the famous figure of 1.5 degrees in Paris, at the beginning of the conference, Nearly all the powerful states were against it. The science was for, but they were against because obviously it was a problem for them. But by the dynamics of the conference, by some particular speeches, by the discussions, and at the end, by the arbitration of the presidency, it was decided. And today we know that it is the objective. There is another point which is the continuity of COPs. Uh, and from this viewpoint, I'm a bit concerned by the fact that it's not clear what will be COP29. Okay, because you know it's a strange thing. The president of the COP becomes president of the COP in the second week of the COP. Well, it's a figment of our imagination. In fact, he is president of the COP since once year. But, uh, for, for, from the, the, the legal point of view, is president, he will be president of the COP during this COP. But what's next? If we don't have in, uh, in the COP29 a, a solid COP, and today we don't know who will be the country. We know that COP30 will be Brazil. And for different reasons, I think that Brazil will be very active. But if we have an excellent COP in Emirates, but a sort of whole in um, next year, we shall, I would say, lose or waste probably one year. Therefore, the continuity, the fact that uh, we must always uh, be in advance, move forward, but to ensure a continuity, it's absolute necessity. One other point, uh, let's be careful about long term. It's surprising to say that. Uh, I remember a chat with uh, Mr. Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg. And he said to me two things, and I think he was right. And I very often 
think about that. He said, you know, uh, Mr. Fabius, there are two mistakes that you must avoid. A, to be too long-term, because in, in the long run we are all dead. If you say to people, okay, uh, that is the aim in 2060. Oh. Therefore, the question of climate is a race against time. We have to act urgently. And it's necessary to have a long-term view, but not too long-term. And the second one is, let's be careful about over-pessimism. We have enough pessimism right now. Uh, if you say to people, today it's difficult, tomorrow it will be more difficult, and I don't speak to you about, uh, okay, they will do nothing. Therefore, to keep, uh, while being honest, a, a, a feeling of hope and to, to act uh, urgently, it's absolute necessity. Yeah, the race against time, I think. Yes, uh, I will just add something to what Laurent said. Partnerships is so important here. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, the COPs are, of course, there's a huge negotiations team behind it. And they are sitting for hours until <laughs> past midnight, talking and talking and talking and looking you, at You have to word. get people tired. If they, if they are tired, it's okay. You see, you need to get people tired the same, until same they give in. Same system at the World <laughs> Policy Conference, by the way. But, yes. yeah. Tired and good food. Yes, so I, I wanted to come to that. So, so what we've found that's been really good is to find something that partners are excited about and work together with the, part, uh, with the partners to make kind of platforms. So Aim for Climate, for example, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate that we're spearheading with the US, for example. It's been up and running for two years. We have over 500 partners, $13 billion of committed investments, and they're all about looking at innovations in smart, climate-resilient agriculture. And this has been really, it's become a platform made for partners, by partners, and they, they choose their innovation sprints, they're calling it innovation sprints, the areas they want to work together in, they get money from, from outside, and they're, they're sprinting innovations. And this, I find, has been a powerful tool of how to accelerate things. And then, of course, hopefully, even after the COP, it just keeps moving. Another thing was the Mangrove Alliance for Climate. This is a platform for getting countries who understand the power of mangroves and restoring mangrove uh, forests. By the way, we don't have any forests in the UAE, but we do have mangrove forests. Um, these are basically our, our trees, and they are amazing swamps or sinks for uh, carbon. And seeing the power of that, plus the power of bi biodiversity, and they're beautiful to look at as well, we've managed uh, to create MAC. We've got 20 countries on board now. The latest uh, uh, newcomer was Germany. And this is about bringing countries together that want to champion certain things to accelerate quickly, because that's what we need right now. Coming to food. Again, food. At the COPs that I've been to, the last two, the food wasn't too good. And when you are doing meeting after meeting and the negotiators are negotiating and they don't have good food and they don't have good coffee, the result isn't good. So what I've done is I got, I said, this cop, I want to make it a little bit different when it comes to food. So what I did, Laurent doesn't know this, I invited all the suppliers, the restaurant, uh, let's say kitchen staff, and we did a workshop called the Climate Conscious Catering Workshop for COPs. And we started this, there were more than 200 chefs, uh, restaurant owners, and we said, we want you to make sure that at COP28, we are serving 1.5 degree aligned food. And with that, we, we taught them, or let's say the experts taught them how to make a burger the burger still can taste good, but now you're taking it with a climate conscious mind. You're looking more at where you can source locally, what kind of flavors you can bring into it. And believe me, the chefs had fun doing this. And then of course, taking into account, how can we reduce the waste, make it a no waste cop. So all this, we started in a way a legacy 
hopefully, that will continue to all COPs, um, starting from COP28. So we may not have it perfect, but I tell you, I hope you can all look forward to the food because it will be very much low carbon food, low carbon snacks, and 1.5 degree aligned menus as well. So one thing is for certain that throughout these long and contentious discussions, no one will be, be hungry, that, no. that's, that's for certain. So the lack of food will not be one of the reasons why things might fall apart, uh, uh, rest assured. Now, uh, being mindful of the time, of course, the session is uh, coming uh, to an end. And uh, if, if we're looking, at, we talked about credibility, we talked about hope, something that is extremely important, of course, the aspirations and expectations of COP28 that lie ahead of us. Now, interesting, it already is garnering momentum as we speak. There's real impetus at a pre-COP28 meeting where countries have come together to agree on a fund to help deal with efforts of climate change. So already uh, some positive steps leading up to this big event. Same question to both of you. What, in your opinion, what would constitute, what would you consider to be a successful outcome of COP28? Mr. President, yeah. we'll start with you. Uh, very practical things. A operationalized loss and damage fund. B, uh, to really achieve the $100 billion uh, a year. C, a commitment to renewable. D, a commitment to phasing out or phasing down fossil fuel. I would add a final comment. Let us not forget, from my own experience, that the climate problem is always a social problem. Uh, we know what are the answers. But if you propose answers to populations who are not in situation to make them efficient, does it make sense? If you say, okay, I raise taxes because I want uh, less um, classical vehicles, energy, and so on. Okay, but if people need them, and if you don't have the money to solve the problem, forget it. Therefore, it is always a social problem, which means it is always a financial problem. And all that we have talked about, which is very interesting, without a financial reform, it doesn't make sense. That, so, that, that is clear words. Now, the Paris Climate Agreement 2015 has raised the bar. Of course, it would be wonderful if post-COP28 we talk about Emirati Climate Agreement that people start referring to. But in all seriousness, uh, I know the ambitions are high. What are you aiming to get out of this? What is the goal? What would be success in your opinion? So on top of everything that Laurent said, because those are extremely important, uh, I will look a little bit more from the human side of things. Uh, first of all, to bring trust and hope back into the process. Um, we, for the first time, have brought in a youth climate champion into the process, and we hope this will continue onwards. And you will see a huge number of young people, not only just being part of a delegation, but these young people will be in the negotiations room because it's about their lives. Um, I hope to get commitments from more than 100 countries on the Emirates Declaration on Food Systems. Uh, I hope also this will be a great platform to show the world who we are as Emiratis, what our values are, what our journey has been, and how committed we are to this cause and that we are a credible partner in this. And, of course, hopefully people will leave COP28 with a smile, feeling that they've had a great experience, that they've come out with an outcome to say, you know what, I'm proud to go home to my kids and tell them I've done something for your future. But I think we all need to step up because we don't have time to discuss and discuss and discuss. I think everyone needs to know that everyone has to give in a little bit so that we can get to where we need to be. We all know what we want at the end of the day. So we need to provide the best ecosystem for everyone to come and be able to convene and discuss. Um, but we also hope that with all the 
um, the list of things that Laurent just mentioned, those are the main outcomes. And for me, it's about hope and positivity. Let's course correct where we are. We owe it to our kids. Hope and positivity. Walk the talk, raise the ambition, and step up the efforts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, to say that there's a global anticipation uh, for this upcoming event is certainly no overstatement. We're very much looking forward to COP28 and hopefully the results that it will produce. Climate change, ladies and gentlemen, is there still a collective will? I guess we will find out soon enough here in this very country, not too far from here in Dubai. I think uh, I speak for all when I say this has been an extremely insightful discussion and is uh, whetting the appetite, if you will, for things to come. The UAE Minister of Climate Change and Environment, Mariam al Mary, and of course, the President of the French Constitutional Council, Laurent Fabius. Thank you so much. This is your applause. Much appreciated.